So I was 12 years old. There's an unbelievable wetsuit that came out at the surf shop, and we walked by. It was me and my three buddies. That night, their parents went to the surf shop and bought them this suit. It was like 480 bucks, which might as well have been thousands back then. And I was devastated. And I was like, how is it that easy? They can just drop 500 bucks on a Tuesday for their kid. Like, I want to create that for my family someday, so I, I'm going to try to start now. I went to all these places to try to work. But I was 12. Everybody told me to get out of here. One place said you can come here and you can make 20 bucks a day to clean these screens. So it was like a silk screening place for shirts and T-shirts. So I would clean the paint and this crap off of these screens with these crazy chemicals after school and get 20 bucks. I'd walk to the surf shop, give it to the guy. After it was fully paid off, i get the wetsuit. I cried the whole way home. It changed me forever. And I was like, I don't need anybody. The National Association stated last year that 96% of agents did not follow up with a client after a closing. However, any person who has bought a house on average they should be generating 5.7 referrals. And I think it's absolutely insane that somebody would close. 96. That's a massive number. And, and, and that, that one person, not, not, not the amount of houses that they're going to buy in their lifetime, that one person should generate 5.7. I don't know where they get the 0.7, but 5.7 referrals just from the one closing. And I think that too many agents are just caught up on the now. They're caught up in the now and bounce to here, bounce to here. And it's all about leads, 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 leads. And, and they even get the leads, but they just don't follow up. And they don't they nurture don't, them. They, they don't, don't create a relationship. It's my biggest pet peeve. <laughs> it drives me bananas. I can go, I can get really hot on the subject. Get hot. Because you have someone that already said, we love you. We like you. We love what you did. And you leave them behind like they're trash. It's so unnecessary. And here, here's some simple math for you. If you're generating 5.7 leads, new clients from that closing, and you're doing five deals a year, how much bigger could your business be year two, exactly. three, four? We, it's one of the first things we go into is like, when was the last time you reached back into your, your closed sell clients? Every time they look at me like, what are you talking about? And, and when we say reach back to them, we don't mean actually reaching back to them with a drip email saying, oh, hey, phone we, call. We, we haven't talked in a while. We should meet up for coffee soon. And you actually just talked yesterday, but the drip email still went out because you didn't know that there were still drip emails going out. It's and such a bad luck. They get the wrong uh, the wrong name uh, and the wrong holiday. <laughs> I am I mean, I literally just go old school. It's and what's, what's so funny is this is actually old school now is to pick up the phone. <laughs> Be like, how's everything with your kids? I actually care. One thing, again, this is going to segue back to Instagram stories. It's fun for me to see my past clients follow me in the Instagram stories. They don't like anything. They never comment, but they're watching. So then that gives me permission to reach back out and to say, hey, you know what? I was literally just thinking about you. And so I saw you in my Instagram stories, and I just wanted to check in and see how everything was doing. Like It's, it's that extra little bit. That really makes a big, big, big difference. And and it's the same thing goes for people that are wanting to jump into ads. But then I go and I look at their Facebook, their Instagram, whatever. And I just pull up a couple of posts and I see some comments. And then I go, where's your reply at? You I didn't reply re to every You didn't comment. reply to anybody. Even if they leave you an emoji, leave an, em an emoji right back. I mean... What are, you, what, are you good, what are you guys doing? It drives me nuts, man. <laughs> so it's the, and it's the same with all these platforms, social media. How do I, everything, how do I gain this following? Engage. Follow a hashtag for whatever you want. If, if you sell real estate in like Seal Beach, follow hashtag Seal Beach Real Estate. F follow who's making comments in there. Engage in the conversation. And that is a way to get more engagement towards you and then to grow especially if you're battling a small city like Seal Beach. Like, you want some leverage, and there's, there's so many ways to do it. Everybody's afraid of the work. 
Definitely. Oh, okay. Everybody wants oh, the easy God. button. Oh, don't let us go there now. Dude, I, <laughs> I've been working my face off since I was 12. I was raised ridiculously poor. You didn't have everything handed no, to you? No, nothing, nothing. There was a silver spoon. Come on now. Nothing. <laughs> it was like made out of wood and dirt. So who, so who is Andy Dane Carter? We jumped, we kind of jumped in and we started talking about yeah. all these different things. Tell us about yourself. And all right. So speaking of me being raised poor. So I was raised in Long Beach. Um, my parents split when I was four years old. And we lived in a teeny tiny studio apartment on like the east side of Long Beach. And we lived out of a cooler, didn't have a fridge. I was raised by a single mom who was just hustling and trying to figure it out. So I had to grow up really fast. And I also became very resourceful really, really quickly. And my whole life shifted when I just realized like there's only one way this is going to happen. I'm going to make it happen or it's not going to happen. And I was a really bad student and all I wanted to do was play sports and work. So I started working when I was 12 because of this wetsuit. And I've told the story a thousand times from stage, but it really changed my life. So I moved from Long Beach over to Seal Beach in Los Al because my mom didn't want me going to Wilson, which is a high school in Long Beach. She wanted me to go to Los Al. So we did that. But then I'm around all these rich kids. I'm like, <laughs> what is this world? Yeah, <laughs> lots of it. And so for me, I was just, it was a blessing and a curse. It was the blessing because I saw what was possible, which was great. Here's the opportunity. And the curse was, how do I do it? I didn't know how to do it yet. So I was 12 years old. There's an unbelievable wetsuit that came out at the surf shop. And we walked by. It was me and my three buddies. That night, their parents went to the surf shop and bought them the suit. It was like 480 bucks, which might as well have been thousands back then. And I was devastated. And I was like, how is it that easy? They can just drop 500 bucks on a Tuesday for their kid. Like I want to create that for my family someday. So I, I'm going to try to start now. I went to all these places to try to work, but I was 12. Everybody told me to get out of here. One place said you can come here and you can make 20 bucks a day to clean these screens. So it was like a silk screening place for shirts and t-shirts. So I would clean the paint and this crap off of these screens with these crazy chemicals after school and get 20 bucks. I'd walk to the surf shop give it to the guy. After it was fully paid off, I get the wetsuit. I cried the whole way home. It changed me forever. And I was like, I don't need anybody. I, that day I became extremely self-sufficient. I was already self-sufficient, but from there, then I worked at, what was the next one? The next one was El Pollo Loco because my friend's dad owned it, who was a rich kid from the school. <laughs> and so I could work there when I was 14 and then from there, I scooped ice cream at Baskin Robbins. And like, then from there, I went to go be a bus boy at this local restaurant. And they thought I wanted to be a bartender and a bar back. So they actually trained me as a bartender when I was 17. I was a junior in high school and I was bartending. <laughs> so I was killing it, making all this money, which was insane. And from there, I went to this place called Walt's Wharf in Seal Beach. Worked there when I was uh, just under 19. And then that's where my life took a major shift because I was going to be a fireman my whole life. I was going to be a fireman. is a great job, everything else. I went to a wine tasting there that was held by the son of the owner, Brian Babcock, and I fell in love with wine, like head over heels in love with wine. Didn't know anything about wine, but that day changed me forever. And then six weeks later, I'm in Bordeaux, France, trying to become the youngest wine sommelier in the country. So I literally have two gears, first and sixth. Like I blazed through all the middle gears. I'm either all in or not interested. So then I worked at this place called Tsunami Sushi, which, you know, is close by. And I was a business partner there. I was the GM. I actually bought out two of his partners and then worked there for four years. I was bought out and then got really back into the wine game and worked for Southern Wine and Spirits for four years. Put on like 65 pounds, was not cut out for the corporate world, was very successful, very, very successful in that world. Didn't like to be told what to do, just not really, wasn't that good for me. Um, and said, I need a month off. And they're like, yeah, you're out of your mind. No one's ever had a month off in this company. And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to walk. I'm going to leave. So I got a month off, got so happy and so healthy in 30 days. And I'm like, I have no idea what I'm going to do, but I'm never going back there. So that was my journey into like yoga and self-discovery and self-development and triathlons. I'm like, I'm out of shape. What's the craziest sport to get me in shape the fastest? So I leaned it into like all these triathlons. So that was my life for a year and a half. Doing yoga, teaching yoga, and racing triathlons. So it happened overnight. 
totally overnight. <laughs> and all of these tools that I use in my investment business today were from my customer service skills. I learned at El Pollo Loco doing the drive through you know, making a uh, cake at um, 31 flavors. I would make ice cream cakes. I could make roses with a piping bag. Like I'll never use that, but it's a, it's part of my journey. Every job I've ever had has led me to where I'm at right now. And I just keep taking those little pieces, but it's always the same. Serve your client at the highest level, whatever that client is, and you'll be fine. When I got into real estate, it was investors. How can I make the investors so much money? I get invited to dinner at Christmas. Not how much money can I make? How much money can I make them? Because then I get in that circle. When I'm in that circle, now I'm not an agent or a broker. Now I'm a peer. And that's where the real money's at. And I think that's huge for especially new agents that may be listening is, you know, you, you jump into this and you think that you can get your license in a week and you're going to sell a house in one day and it's going to be super easy and you don't work and you see all these different things. And then you realize, oh, crap, that's actually not the way that it, it actually works. You have to work hard. You have to do the right things. But everything that I did when I first started in real estate, everybody would say, OK, those are all cliché treat people the, the way you want to be treated, follow up, communicate. And I said, that's all you have to do. That's it. It's basic stuff, but you got to do it. And what I started then doing is I said, okay, let's, let's make this even more interesting. So in the army, we're basically told you don't really have to do anything new or exciting. Just do the common things and do them differently, do them uniquely, do them uncommonly. And so when it came to real estate is, you know, if everybody is doing three bed, two bath, 1500 square feet, I'm talking about the baseball team. I'm talking about the fireplace. I'm exactly. talking about the barbecue and everybody is going to say, wow, look at this. You know, for me, I give this example to a lot of agents, every open house that I would do, I'd walk in, I'd take my business cards and I would fling them into the living room. Every person would think this guy's crazy, mm -hmm. but every single person would walk into the open house, look at the business cards on the floor pick them up, look at my branding, look at my name. Some of them would turn them back into me. Some of them would put them in their pocket, but then they would walk through the rest of the house. And then they saw this guy's got business cards on the toilet seat cover. Like what it's is a going forced on? forced call to action. I Your love it. Your brain is literally going and looking straight at the card. So I even if it. they didn't pick them up, which they did, because I always put them in stacks of 10, so I would count. Even if they didn't pick them up, they just saw me in so many places around the master bedroom pillow, all these different places to where when they left, and even if they didn't have any questions or whatever, they saw me 10 different times, not one time at the front desk with my, you know, phone and, you know, some snacks and think that, you know, they deserve, I deserve them to, to do everything with me now. Mm -hmm. They would go to the next house, <laughs> walk into the bathroom and think of me, which is, it sounds weird. No, but it's really, really important. But it's very important. And you used your training from the army. Like we talked a little bit about, you know, um, that there's, there's certain things that the human brain needs to remember. And I love that tactic. I've never even heard of that before. It's great. That's a, it's a big reason why we love to teach people now to just have a podcast at your open house with a microphone and your laptop. And you can ask them questions and everything else. If they see 12 houses on that Saturday and Sunday, they're going to remember the one that had a podcast in the kitchen. I, I always would tell agents also just print out all of the open houses that are going on in the area. Have just a, th a, mm -hmm. a little bit of your header at the top. And give it to them when they leave. You know, say your thank yous. Ask if they had any questions and say, I know you're going to look at your phone anyway. So here I just printed them all out for you. They're not just mine. They're everybody's. You know, if you have any questions, uh, I'd love to answer them for you. Well, they're going to look at your sheet. They've got your branding. They walk into the bathroom. They remember you. They go, wow, this one is not like that other guy. Let's and, give that guy a call. And that's how you separate yourself. <laughs> it's like, how hard are they going to work for me? I was just talking to one of my inspectors this morning at this property. And he's like, the the most stuff he hears from from everybody as to why they're not using this person anymore or why they didn't actually close a deal with this particular agent. The same thing over and over again. It's always the same thing. It's they weren't going to go to bat for me. They didn't fight for me. And that's what I tell people all the time. Like, do you want somebody just going to wear like a nice little name tag and hold your hand and walk you from house to house? Or do you want a savage? Like this is a major, major purchase or sale. Do you want someone who's really into this and it's their life's drive or someone that kind of, does it on the side.
And you want somebody that's going to tell you the good and the bad. 100%. I think that there's tons of agents that, you know, their client wants to write an offer. They know it's a bad deal and they'll still write the offer. Me, I'm telling them that's a bad deal. And you're you, wasting everybody's time if you don't. Exactly. And you're not, they're going to realize at some point, man, that was a bad deal. I got screwed over by the agent, that agent. We don't want that agent anymore. Okay. Well, there went your 5.7 referrals. There went all these different things. All the metric shifts. And I love what you guys are doing with that because it's just not that hard. <laughs> like it's not that hard to say, listen, your house is probably not going to sell for 1.9 and here's why. Like this is a hard conversation, but we're going to have it right now. And we're going to discuss the actual math around this particular deal. No emotion, no drama. I know you're attached to this property. You brought your kids home here from like, like the hospital. I get it. But let's look at the math. What's, what's really going to happen for, for you? That instantly lets them know that you have their back. Like you actually have their fiduciary best interest in mind. More agents than not don't. And you can tell, this is a great property. You should do this next house. This is a great property. You should write an offer. I tell them like, there's a crack in the foundation. This is going to be a nightmare. Or we can use this for like a price reduction and escrow. It's up to you. But here's here's what I see. Yeah, and you're setting the expectations. And you're, and I let the people know, hey, if you don't want to hear my opinion, let me know now because I'm planning on giving you my opinion the That's entire right. way. Well, but, they hired you as the <laughs> professional. I'm supposed to give you my opinion. But I don't want to lose the deal. I have commission breath. I need to pay my rent and I need to pay my bills. And, you know, I've been working so hard. I deserve this. So this is the first thing I tell <laughs> all of those people. But it's... I've been in a lot of listing appointments for huge deals and small deals, or it's with my team to train them. I tell them all the same thing. This deal is not going to make or break my world. I am here to help you. I don't need this deal. I am literally here to help you. I have an all in fiduciary responsibility to you and it's going to be fun for me to show you. And that's it. And I go, I'll usually kind of flip it on them at some point and say, I am very much interviewing you as much as you're interviewing me. My time is wildly important to me. I love my family. If this isn't going to work, I really want to know right now. But we've talked for about 30 minutes. You know what I'm all about. And I can really, really change your life. Definitely. And that's it. Like, you want to know why? Because it's the truth. <laughs> like, as soon as you sign with me, it is game on. Or you're going to use me at some point anyways after you go through everybody or somebody from my team. But this is why like, I like the traditional kind of real estate in this hyper-local area because I do so many other things all over the country and do other things. But like, I still like, to, I love working with first-time home buyers. I'm working with two right now that are friends of the family. I forgot how much fun it is. It's the best. Nice. I'm going to flip the script here. We... Uh originally talked about how our mission is to help agents have a business and life that they love. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't have the greatest life, even if they have the greatest business. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are putting their personal lives to the side, putting their personal aspects to the side. Uh, what would be a piece of advice that you would give to an agent that's listening to this, that, you know, they're grinding every day, they're doing the things that they're supposed to be doing but they're pushing the family to the side. They're telling the kid, hey, just shut up. I got to get to the phone. I get. I need to answer these emails right now. We can, we can do that later. And they just have a terrible life. I, I see it every day. And this is why I'm hammering the be at home at 3 o'clock so hard in my entire world. And 3 o'clock? I'm at 3 o'clock every day. Oh, man. If my wife were to hear this thing I, right now. That's what I'm doing. Woo. I'm getting <laughs> I'm getting everybody on, especially in the real estate space, where you're like, honey, I can't even show properties until 5. So here's a little backstory. We had the highest divorce rate in our country's history in 2008 and nine. That was not by accident. We had a major collapse in the real estate market. We had a major collapse in all this stuff across the globe. Now, those kids, let's just call them three and four years old, you, you know, are in a horrible short sale scenario and you're fighting and now you're fighting about stuff you'd have never normally fought about. Money's an issue. You actually get divorced. Well, now you fast forward 10 years the kids are thrashed and now they're in high school and they're eating pills like Tic Tacs because of like a bad financial situation that they got into over some real estate they didn't really need to do. So I just try to tell people like your home, your castle, your world is so much more important than your job. When I'm fighting with my wife and then I leave for work, 
I'm at like 22%, which is horrible for my investors, horrible for my family, horrible for everybody. I have to take care of my physical body and mental state first and then my family and then business because that part's so important. I always wanted to be the coach of my kids' teams way before I ever had kids or before I ever got married. That was my goal. When my son Jackson was born, I had 19 properties in escrow and I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And he came a month early and I moved my office home from our beautiful office on second street. I moved it home because I wanted to be close to family. And I also knew if I created this the right way, I could be home early every single day. So I did. So I can now show people it's possible. There's so much you can do when you schedule out your day. When you put your clients first and your children see it, it is catastrophic to your relationship. And it's always going to be that way. Most men, especially, at some point try to repair it. It's very difficult after a certain age. So I decided to punt however much I'm going to make, 10 million or 20 million from my kids ages zero to 12 and be home. Because when I'm 90, I'm not going to care that I have 360 million instead of 390. But I have an intact relationship with my family like no other. That's like iron. And I get to teach my kids it's possible. I get to lead by example. Like that's my favorite part and I'm documenting it. So now they get to see one of the greatest comments I ever got from my son. I say this a lot is almost two years ago. So he was three and my little one was one and I was leaving for work and my wife and I was flying out the door, which I never do. And my son was like, where are you going, daddy? And his like little voice. And I go, I'm going to work, honey. And he starts laughing. He's like, you don't work. <laughs> and I just knew right then I'd, I'd won as a dad. Yeah. I'm running five companies and working my face off and he doesn't think I have a job. I won. Yeah, that's great. No, I love that. And uh, what what do you say for the for the people that, you know, they can't tap into that vulnerability where they're, they're they're not willing to allow those personal things and they're not they're not willing to allow those breakthroughs to happen and they just keep on piling the the backpacks gets really heavy oh, if you don't man. dump it out. Woo. The more vulnerable you are, the more permission you give somebody else to be vulnerable. And when we do that at scale, we're a really happy place. So for me, you get a choice. Every day is a choice. Everybody gets the same 24. You hear all these gurus and motivational people. I get the same 24 hours, you know, as Jeff Bezos, whatever. True, what you do with it is very unique to you. Like I put my kids as a very high priority for me. It's my choice. You could choose to have your clients run your life. You can choose to say, hey, I'm at your beck and call from five to nine and I'm going to punt those relationships or you can restructure and say, look, I am yours from 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. From 3 p.m. on, if we don't have a scheduled showing or a scheduled appointment, I'm going to be hard to reach because I'm home with family. Anybody that's worth anything is going to respect that more. Yeah, definitely setting those expectations are huge. Everybody knows if they try to get a hold of me on Sunday, it's absolutely impossible because Jonathan has planned a day with his family somewhere mm. and there's no way that you're getting a hold of him unless it's an emergency. And if it is, you'll know how to get a hold of him. Exactly. And <laughs> I tell all my business part, everybody knows like there's a certain time of day where if we're not losing a million dollars a second, I don't care. Yeah. Don't call me. And same thing from my phone at night. I have it on do not disturb starting at seven at night nice. and it doesn't ping on the next day until 8 a.m. Why? Because when I wake up early in the morning, even if I wanted to grab my phone, I know there's nothing there. And it's it's been several years now since that would actually <laughs> actually happen. But I think everybody just wakes up and they go to their phone and then they just start consuming all this negativity. And that's instantly. energy. Well, and, and you make a great point. When you let the day control you, like I step into my day, not the other way around. So, because every day for a lot of years, I would grab my phone and be hit with tons of like flaming two by fours. None of it was good ever. Yeah. And that set the tone. It set, you know, like a ton of anxiety early in the morning. And now I'm, con I'm in that now. Now I'm in it. I do the opposite now. I create as much calm space as possible because I know that's coming. But now there's a big giant cushion. So 
I love having my phone off. I, I choose when I turn it on. I choose when I turn it off and I'm pretty hard to get hold of in the middle. I would say the only thing I'm doing from four o'clock to eight o'clock on my phone is posting in my stories because it's my daily vlog. Instagram stories is my daily vlog and that's what I'm doing. Yeah, I think uh, something I'm part of the Genius Network with Joe Polish. And uh, mm. one of the things that he sent out this morning was if you uh, if you sleep with dogs, you wake up with fleas. Mm. And just being around other people that are impacting your life is super huge as well. And I think that Agreed. sometimes you have to uh, look at those that are around you and realize that, hey, this person not yeah, I, I, I can get past it every now and then. But if you actually take a step back and look at how all those little things have added up to your to your marriage, to your business, mm. and how all these things are affecting you, it's huge. What would you say is a, a, a piece of advice to somebody that's, you know, they're just running with the wrong tribe and they need to they they need to look at the people around them and make some adjustments. Sure, you have to audit your circle. It's so important. If your close knit ten that's around you is not at least double your net worth, get around some new people. If that's a goal of yours, if your tight knit 10 is not like an incredible dad or incredible mom, get around some new people. You don't have to get rid of all of them. Just cut a couple of them. And I can guarantee it. If you're listening right now, you know what two you need to cut. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the ones that are like, Hey, we're at the bar. It's happy hour. Like, you, you know, I'm not saying you have to punt them forever. Just put them in a different category which is important because we only have so much energy in the day. Our, our day is like a giant water balloon and everybody's poking holes in it. By the end of the day, it's empty. So I'm extremely mindful of where I put my time and my energy because you're a reflection of that. If you're around high level people that really care, <laughs> it rubs off on you. If you're with these energy sucks and all they do is talk about other people, woe is me, victim mentality, you will get sucked down there even if that's not what you really want to do. I see it. I saw it in myself when I was younger. I'm like, what is my problem here? All my friends were getting by. And I'm like, I, I love you, but I, I, I inspired to go elsewhere. So I started writing checks and masterminds, mentors, catapulted my life. So th that's kind of how things happen for me as well. But for me personally, I got to a point where I started chasing accolades, mm. success, mm. when that was never the goal. In 2011, President Obama gave me his volunteer of the year for the entire country. Oh, wow. Congrats. And thank you. And that was probably the most significant award I've ever received. Uh, but then I started aiming for, you know, top broker and top mm -hmm. this and top that and, you know, whatever. And why do you think you did that? Because I was surrounded by people that were doing that as well. And they were right. chasing that success and they were chasing those awards. And I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to show them up. Right. So you wanted a small piece of you to kind of be fulfilled through those things. Yeah. You wanted like an attaboy, right? Yeah. And it really makes you feel good when somebody else tells you you're doing a good job. Yeah. But then I continued. It can be a superpower or a curse. I get it. And it's a curse. For mm -hmm. me, it was a curse because I realized that, Hey, th the thing that makes me most happy is helping others. Mm -hmm. I, I realized that very early in my life that if I can make other people successful, I'll become successful. It's very, yeah. it's very easy. I have the same philosophy. You were on a path to create something through these ridiculous accolades. So you got one from Obama and then you started to be around people that were also chasing these dreams. And because you're competitive, you wanted to one up them, right? So there's a definitive path of like how we're built is, is real. It's hard for us to change some of those things, but if we can look into them as our superpowers, like it's okay to be a people pleaser. It's actually an incredible superpower when used correctly. Yeah. It's okay to have crazy ADHD and be a, just a machine when harnessed correctly. It can also turn you into the biggest drug addict on the planet. So you have to know yourself. Self-awareness is so important. And what I was going to say was that you just have to find the things that make you happy. That's right. Because if you can find the things that make you happy, everything else is going to work out. I was in New Orleans uh, two months or so ago, and we were doing a speech there in New Orleans. And I started walking down with slacks on uh, and uh, suit jacket and whatnot. And I actually stopped and I walked back to the room, changed into the jeans that I wanted to wear because they made me happy, mm -hmm. went, delivered my talk 
And then I actually was walking off stage and then I actually came back and everybody was like, wait, what? This guy just came back on stage. Mm -hmm. And I cut the MC off and I said, look, you guys got to be happy. And for me to not tell this story would just be drastically off. I was in my room. I had the slacks on. I walked in here. I wanted to deliver as much value as possible to you guys. But I was not happy because I hate wearing slacks. I don't wear slacks. Mm -hmm. Right. So I went back. I changed in the jeans. I was happy. And now you guys are you know, crying in the audience, cheering in the audience. And th the reason that was able to happen is because I first felt good about what I was delivering. And I think that, you know, some people, even if they have huge amounts of success, they have to just ask a very basic question on, am I happy? Are you happy? Are you comfortable in your own skin? Does everybody else's opinion really matter? All these things are super important. I'm super proud of you for going back and doing that. And because I was stuck in that for a long time as well. I have, a, I have a similar story. I'm covered in tattoos. Covered. I have a lot of tattoos myself. They're awesome, right? Yeah. But I used to wear these suits and long sleeves all the time because I didn't think I was going to be taken seriously if I have these tattoos, right? <laughs> so I had this limiting belief that was not even close to true. Yeah. And so, so probably for two years, I would run from Long Beach to Seal Beach and back for lunch. And I would just run. I'd shirt off, covered in tattoos, trunks, and running shoes. And we had a meeting this one this one afternoon with our top investor, millions and millions and millions with this guy. And I ran and then came back, showered, got all suited back up, and was in the meeting. And he's like, Andy, I was driving here, and there was this guy that looked exactly like you, but he was covered in tattoos. And I was like, yeah, that was me. And he's like, no. And I just rolled up my sleeves. He's like, oh, that's really cool. And I was, again, that was a pivotal moment for me. I'm like, if he doesn't care, why do I care so much? Yeah. And that's when I started. And and I think that's huge. Like if, if people are calling you crazy or insane or. Then I'm going in the right direction. Then you're doing the right I, thing. I agree. That means that you're not doing what everybody else is doing. You're doing something that's catching somebody's eyes that's and that's right. not a bad thing. Well, and here's, the, here's a perfect <laughs> example with all this stuff with social media and branding and marketing, right? My family stopped following me. My friends stopped following me on all the different social media platforms because I was pushing out content so hard and I really cared about it. I just didn't care what they thought. And then it's all come full circle. But you, there's going to be pushback when you're creating content. It's something new. Anytime there's a disrupt in your norm, all the people that are around you are going to freak out. Not because they don't believe in you, because they're afraid for you. So... I just never adopted their fears so that I don't care. But if you latch on to their fears, it can be really, really, really catastrophic to your growth Definitely, be because you care about what they think. Yeah. I take their opinion into consideration. I just don't do anything with it. <laughs> well, I mean, if I did everything that my family thought I was going to do in life, I would definitely not be sitting here right now. I wouldn't be doing half the things because first to graduate from college, first to do all these different things mm -hmm. and, um, for whoever's listening, that doesn't even mean anything. Um, it means something to me. It means that you broke the lineage. like. But it a, means that you can break through. It, mm -hmm. Exactly. And it means that, hey, you can you can put something on a vision board and make it, a, make it happen. And, you know, I wake up and I write in a grateful journal, but I actually don't write about what I'm currently grateful for as much as I write about what I'm grateful for in the future. Quantum physics. People it's are real. You're crazy. Nope. No, I'm not. Because when it happens, I'm going to go back and show you. I wrote it. I put it in here. I said this was going to happen. So my brain starts seeing different things a little bit differently. It the starts moving a little bit differently. I start, you know, instead of clicking that button, I might click this button. Instead of doing that color, I might do this. Just because now my brain is now ingrained to how can I get him to this point? Because that's where he wants to be. And he can visualize himself there so much. It's absolutely I mean, we can talk all day about visual, visualization. I, I love it. I'm a, I'm a huge believer that what you're chasing is chasing you. Yeah. Good or bad. Yeah. And you want you want the people who want to be you, around you, that want to work with you, that want to be like you and do the things that you like. And if you're chasing, and we use this, uh, I'm, I'm actually writing a book on it right now. It's called The Law of the Bullseye, where if you were to take a bullseye and give it to an agent and say, throw it, the, the bullseye is a $10 million listing, outer ring is a $100,000 listing, go. Every agent gets it, go for the $10 million listing. If I tell them that the $10 million listing they would get, but they would get a divorce, they'd be, have a drinking problem, they'd have high levels of stress, anxiety. Unfortunately, they might kill themselves and they're definitely not getting any referrals. 
would you still go for it? A lot of them, unfortunately, still say yes. Until I tell them that that the outer ring would have became your best friend. You guys would have enjoyed your wife. To, your, yeah. If you get married, if, mm-hmm. you would have enjoyed taking your kids out to sports. You would have got a referral. We would have got another referral. You would have been happy. You would have enjoyed your life, and you would have drastically surpassed that bullseye mm-hmm. uh, if you would have just focused on not the number. And uh, I and think the that, relationship and, around and, the numbers exactly. And it's it's uh, it's insane that you know even you and I just sitting here talking about different things, if somebody were to go back and we encourage you to go back and listen, they're not that hard to do. They're not. (laughs) That's the biggest secret. It's just not that hard. You have to be willing to put in the work and repeat and repeat and repeat. Yeah, because uh, unfortunately, it's not as easy to list a house. It's not as easy. You just don't throw a sign out there and and hope it sells. And, uh, you know, there's some places where prices are plateauing or even slightly dipping and, and the things that you've done, which are not that much, uh, you need to realize, Hey, I actually need to work and I don't need to work that much. I don't need to work that many hours. I just got to do the right things. That's the beauty of Southern California <laughs> real estate. And I love your stat about 5.7. Like my friends, if you're listening to this <laughs> and you close seven deals this year, seven in the whole 12 month cycle and you all you did was nurture those seven deals like your life depended on it. You would double your business the next year. And, and again, I'm going to push <laughs> into the fact that nurture does not mean drip campaign. No, templated nurture. email. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> I treat it like a kid, like a baby, right? Yeah. Not every buyer is ready to go from st- straight out to running down the street. Like it's a process. They're going to fall. They're going to stand up on the table. They're going to bump their head. The more they know you have their back for like, no matter what I've had clients that worked with for years, like, I can't believe you're still with us. And I'm like, I actually care about your best interest. And I know that some scumbag is going to get you into a property. It's going to put you in a bad position for 10 years. And I like you. So I'm not gonna let that happen. And what that means is if you can get 5.7 referrals by doing the right things, you know, please don't continue to just punch down somebody's throat buying or selling <laughs> two weeks after they just bought or sold a house with you. You know, don't send them a, a, a car that's shaped in the form of a house uh, every single month asking them if they know somebody. Just love them. Do the right things by them. Actually call them to say happy birthday right. and don't end it with, oh, just in case. Hey, I'm a referral person. If just you so me. you know, I'm still around. Like, and just that's do a great the right point. Things. Do the right thing. And that's a great point. Is, and that's why it's so important to have your list of vendors. Like have three or four painters, three or four people that can do this. When you are the person they call for everything. You have so much value. It's crazy. Hey, Andy. So I'm thinking about doing this refi on this really crazy building and it's a commercial tied up in this trust. What do you think? No problem. Here's the attorney you're going to call. He's probably going to charge you three or four grand because I get a huge discount from them. Blah, 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 blah. And here's where you go. And then they close on it. This thing is a mess. Okay. Here's my window guy. Here's my, you become who, if they think about real estate, it's just you. And I, I think that Agents need to realize it's not just the vendors as well as it's, it's other agents, you know, they're not your competition. They're not the ones that are there that are looking at, you know, killing your business. You can help each other. You can send referrals to each other. You can do so much to provide so much value to them as well. Because remember, you're only working your niche. You're working the people that know, like, and trust you. And if you have to worry about the fact that they might go to somebody else, if you're talking with them or seeing, then you actually do not have their trust. They no. actually don't love you because, right. um, and, and I think that, you know, we had a previous guest talking just all, all on agent to agent referrals and that's all she does. I love it. It's insane. And if you do it across the country, you can make a lot of money, not doing much. Not doing much. But being a good person. But being a great person, yeah, definitely. Like there's there's nothing wrong with reaching out to who you think is the competitor in your farm. And it's always fun to break that stigma, right? Which I love to disrupt the real estate market. It's one of my favorite things to do. But if there's some way... So how do we disrupt it a little bit more? I think just... Just letting people in, I think, is huge. I love what you guys are doing about showing like the full scope of like here's... 
here are all the different kinds of agents there are. But I really think like helping other teams, helping other brokerages, like really leaning into the fact that like, I mean, that slaps a type A ego filled person in the throat. They're like, they're not intimidated by me. They're actually sending me business. What's going on? Over a little bit of time, you break that stigma. And now maybe you guys are having coffee. Maybe it's not so weird at these like social mixers where it's like, that's the person on the farm and <laughs> look at her over there. When you break all those walls down and you know you're so good and your confidence is so good because it's from a pure place, I don't really think you have any competition. No, not at all. I know your time is super valuable. Before we wrap up, can you just tell us, you know, what it is and some of the things that you're doing? I know that you're in the investing realm and the real estate realm mm -hmm. training. We've got, we're in a podcast studio and got all these different things going on. Can you just tell our viewers, you know, a little bit more about what you do? Sure. So we do a lot in the investment space. We help a lot of investors buy and sell lots of different multi. We help a lot of people flip houses. We we try to speak the full language of real estate. So we do a lot of probate. We, we just have a lot of relationships. So we try to train a lot of agents. I train a lot of investors. We try to get people to launch podcasts. We have a huge um, a podcast academy that's going to be rolling out next month, which is the blueprint for how to start it. And here's why. And it's not just to plug a microphone into a laptop. It's really getting to know your why and your voice and why it's so important. And we talk about legacy and building a digital footprint that's going to live on for thousands of years. So your great, great grandkids get to hear you and relate to you. I would give anything to hear a podcast from my great grandfather when he got back from World War I with his seven brothers. Anything. I'd pay you a million dollars right now like because I don't have any of it. And I always get choked up because it's so important to me, but we're letting all of it just go away. That's why I'm document. If I get hit by a car on the way home, my kids have three years of me documenting every single day. They know exactly what I was about, where my passions are, what I would put up with, what I wouldn't. And they would know me as their dad. So many of us are taking that and leaving it on the curb. And you only really have two excuses. You're either afraid or you're lazy. You have no excuse to take that from your family. Where can people find you on social? How can they connect with you? And can you tell them about your book as well? Yeah, sure. So I'm extremely easy to find on social <laughs> media. It's just my name, Andy Dane Carter. Um, D-A-N-E is my middle name. It's on everywhere. We have a really cool show on YouTube where we do lots of different stuff from investing. The podcast lives there. Um, it's also on Roku and Amazon and Apple TV. If you guys go to my website, all my books are free. You guys can download digital copies for free. It's just my name, andydanecarter.com. Again, Andy Dane Carter. It was phenomenal. Thank you so much for inviting us into your space. No, thanks and, for having me. It's an honor and, to be on the show. Uh, we look forward to continuing the conversations with you. Thank you. Thanks brother. Sweet. Hey everybody, this is Jonathan Hawkins. Thank you so much for staying until the very end of this podcast. I definitely appreciate it. As always, make sure to reach out to me via social media at Jonathan Hawkins Official. Send me a comment, shoot me a DM. If you have any questions, you can also comment below. Thank you so much. Don't forget to subscribe below. And remember, who you hire truly matters.